Hello, everyone. I am Mary Schwartz from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the co-chair for today's event together with Mike Burkert from London School of Economics. We want to welcome all the participants that have joined us today. Thank you so much for participating in our ECGI Spotlight Seminar today. We hope you will enjoy the seminar. Today's session will include three great papers on environmental and social issues. The papers will be presented by Professor Michelle Laurie from Drexel University in ECGI, Professor Oni Michaeli from the University of Hong Kong in ECGI, and Professor Gayscott Ormazabel from IECE Business School and ECGI. Each paper will be presented for approximately 13 minutes and will be followed by a short Q&A session that will include questions submitted by the audience. Feel free to ask questions while uh, the presenter are presenting their papers. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A chat box. And we look very much forward to uh, reading your questions and uh, reading them out to the presenters and hopefully getting some interesting responses. So we hope we, you have fun. And uh, uh, we're going to go right to our first paper, which is uh, the paper presented by Professor Oni Michaeli. The paper is uh, titled ES Risks and Shareholder Voice. The floor is yours, Roni. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we have a relatively short time, so I'm going to jump right to it. Uh, this paper is co-authored with uh, Gim or Donis Calafi and with Zidina Robio, both of them are from uh, University of Bristol. So just by way of background that uh, I know is relevant also to uh, Michelle's paper that is going to come next is the exponential increase in uh, uh, the flow of US sustain sustainable fund um, which really uh, reaches, not only reaches new height, but uh, really show a uh, big, significant growth, double the total from 2019, nearly 10 times the, what it was uh, 10 years ago. Interestingly, as you can see, uh, sort of also on the chart is that while it's still a minority in terms of vote, it's still a significant increase from uh, 1.8% of the vote to 4.7% 4, 4 of the vote. So uh, sort of we see a movement of the dial, not only in terms of the fund, but really in terms of their uh, ability to vote um, and, and to impact. Uh, of course, this uh, uh, sort of increase in flow uh, is coming in response to increased demand by uh, uh, sort of consumers and institutions. Um, and relevant to what I'm going to talk here, I'm going to mention that uh, actually this increased demand uh, was met both by funds families that are can be labeled as ES, as environmental social. Calvert is one example for that. And also by uh, fund families that are not ES, BlackRock, Fidelity, that cannot be labeled as, as ES, as the one that really put the environment or social as one of their main frames. And I'll show you later how we and other are, are doing this categorization. Um, in our specific sample, which is from 2011-2018, uh, we see that ES fund votes, 40% of those votes or the weights are for ES fund of non-ES families and 60% of ES fund that are ES families. So it's almost 50-50. The bottom line is that there is really a, a sort of very significant uh, um, amount for both of them. It's not only for only families that are ES or not. Um, when we look, we look at ESG fund voting, um, it's first, it's pretty clear from the literature that the voting on corporate policy has been advocated as one of the main mechanisms that investor in general and ES investor in particular can use to achieve their goal or their objective. Um, but the fact that they can do it does not mean that they are always doing it. And here I chose to bring a quote from the a former acting chair of the SEC that suggests there, is, there are significant concern of how they use their, vo their vote and whether they fulfill their fiduciary responsibility to investors. And indeed, this is something that is ongoing even now with the current SEC. Um, the research question that we're going to focus on here are related exactly to this issue. What we are going to focus in is on really sort of uh, two main issues. The first one is whether fund vote on ES proposal in a manner consistent with our stated agenda. 
Okay, we're not the first to do this one, and there is a prior evidence, including by my friend and co-author Michelle, that is coming up next. Um, the second part is unique to what we're doing here, which is how their votes are determined by strategic consideration. And when we speak here, when I speak here about strategic consideration, particularly what we mean is how is fund votes are affected by the potential conflict of interest between the objective of the fund family and the fund itself. And of course, this is something that is particular to those funds that are ES that belong to non-ES family. And this is really what we are going to explore here. Now, just to give you some taste of, uh, of what's going on, uh, the first table, which is really a two by two uh, table, uh, where we have the family preference or ideology, that is whether we're talking about families that are ES or families that care less about ES, and then we have the fund goal, whether the fund, the fund itself is ES and non ES. And we see here several, already several very interesting patterns. First, the good news in a way is that ES funds support more of ES proposal than non ES funds. Okay, whether you belong to a family that is ES or family that is not ES, you see that by a wide margin, ES funds within each and every family type support more of uh, 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 ES proposal, okay? So they can actually claim, you see, we are accountable. Look at this difference, okay? However, um, what we also see is that non-ES funds, okay, in ES families, Okay, so we have non-ES funds in ES families. This is the 37.47%, not only support more of this proposal than non-ES funds in non-ES families versus 5%, but in fact, they, pro they support more of this proposal, okay, of those ES funds that belong to the non-ES family, to the Fidelity and BlackRock of the world. In other words, it's already giving you here, and this is really what triggered us looking at that, saying that maybe family preference matters uh, to a significant extent, okay? And we're going to look how this affects each sort of their voting. So uh, again, given the sort of time constraint, um, luckily my slide number seven is already the main results. Uh, so whatever I'll be able to do afterwards is okay. Uh, and what this slide is actually, I'm going to show you in a chart, I'm going to show you sort of the main results. So what we have, on the x-axis is the voting outcome uh, of the ES proposal. And then we have the group average support, and I'll show you the four or five group that I'm going to show you. So the first one is the support for ES proposal uh, by non-ES funds that belong to non-ES family. Okay, so not surprising, they're below the 45 degree line, right? And you see that their support is very low for both voting outcome that uh, where the, the, the proposal does not pass and also when, even when it passes overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly uh, it's still the support is relatively moderate, but this is not surprising, okay? Also probably it's not surprising, hopefully, that if we look at ES funds of ES families, you see that support is about 45 degree line. This means on average, they support more of these proposals um, and all these results, by the way, I'm showing you here are also statistically significant. Maybe we'll get to that as well. Um, then if we look at non-ES funds of ES families, uh, you see that they're like, you know, sort of the, the, their support uh, is above the 45 degree line. It is above uh, sort of uh, the support of the non-ES funds of non-ES families. Again, family matter here a lot. And I think for us, the uh, sort of the most striking result is actually the pattern of support of ES funds of non-ES families. So you see that they have relatively moderate, but above the 45 degree line support for those proposals that are very unlikely to pass proposal with uh, 10 or 20% uh, um, sort of support. Uh, and they also have reasonable support for those proposals that are very likely to, to pass. And by the way, there are few and in between of those proposals that are, are, are passing, not only in our sample, but in general. But what is really interesting is really sort of their lack of support when their vote is more likely to be pivotal when the, the votes are somewhere between 
uh, um, sort of 40 to uh, uh, 40 to 60 percent. So what do we see? We see first support for ES fund, uh, a greater support the non-ES fund as we showed, and ES funds of uh, uh, non-ES families funds vote strategically. When their vote matter, they seem to shy away from supporting uh, consistent with their family preference or uh, as both on it all uh, nicely defined it as so opposed to the family ideology. Uh, family often prevail over fund when it really matters. Okay, so uh, um, so how do you, do you do the fund classification? To do the fund classification, it's, it's relatively easy and straightforward. We're not the first one who's done it. Basically, we're looking like investor at the fund name uh, and do it uh, with that. We also took a random sample of 200 of those funds and uh, uh, sort of, uh, and check them. Uh, and basically there is no type one error, okay? There is a little bit of type two error, but no type one error when you read the prospectus of those funds. Uh, a more complicated uh, task is uh, uh, to do the family classification. And here uh, sort of we've followed actually two strategies. One is uh, uh, borrowed from the political economy, the one that both in et al, um, have used in a recent JFP paper, which is really identified the ideology, sort of looking at the pairwise, uh, uh, or looking at the voting of the fund and uh, sort of looking at some measure of similarity and identify them not by what they say, but by what they do. Um, it's somewhat involved process, but uh, um, it's very, very elegant uh, uh, sort of procedure. Um, and this was the first one that we did. And the second one that we've done is much simpler one, just looking at their average vote in the year before. Um, but just to highlight, I think it's interesting actually that these two measures are extremely highly correlated of the correlation of 0.96 uh, between the two measures. And also it is persistent. Uh, we have data of nine years and we're doing it every year. And you see also extremely high persistency in the classification of both over the years. Um, just to show you who is on the right and who is on the left, who is the East families and who is not. Um, so not surprising with Calvert, you know, sort of on the very left um, and uh, uh, sort of all in, in both classification, BlackRock, Fidelity, Vanguard, DFA are all on the right as uh, uh, for classification, looking at the vote in the non US families. And I think also interesting to mention that ISS recommendation actually are more on the left in terms of uh, can be classified the recommendation as ES families. Okay, um, in the one minute that I've, I've left, I'll just show you the empirical strategy, which is sort of basic regression that is very highly saturated with uh, uh, sort of with fixed effects for everything you can think about. Uh, hopefully Michelle will ask me about it so I can talk about those slides. Uh, but the main result is what you see in front of you here, consistent with the, with the chart, um, suggesting that indeed ES funds of non-ES families are more supportive of uncontested ES proposal relative to the, the non-ES funds of non-ES families. And more and more, the difference shrinks dramatically and significantly uh, by 27%, in fact, uh, in terms of the economic impact uh, when we talk about results that are contested uh, results. Um, last thing that I'm going to show you is actually looking at active and passive funds or at active and index fund. And here the result is even more striking. Okay, perhaps not surprisingly, all the action is coming not from the index fund or the passive fund that don't devote a lot of time to it in either follow management or follow ISS uh, without much of their own input, we see that the entire action is coming from the active fund. And in fact, in the critical uh, uh, direction, you see that the ES of non-ES and non-ES, okay, those funds completely converge when it really matters. Okay, so I'm going to skip all the robustness and I'm going to go to just to the concluding remark and sort of two findings that I think are worth mentioning. Uh, ES funds support many more ES proposals than non-ES funds. And this is true also for identical firms, same agenda item, really hold to host of control. And the most important that uh, ES funds of non-ES families 
On average, they support ES proposal. So they can go and uh, claim the bragging right that they're doing what they're supposed to do, consistent with the stated goal. But they fail to support when their vote really counts, aligned with family preference, um, and they vote strategically. And so we label it really as another form, or we see it another form of more sophisticated and strategic greenwashing, in addition to other types of greenwashing that have been found around. Thank you, and hopefully I will not sort of too rushed uh, uh, in the explanation. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Ron, for a crisp, Ronnie, for a crisp uh, presentation. Now let's move on at least to have one question. Michelle, may I ask you, please? Uh, yeah, so Ronnie, I'd like to go ahead and ask a question. First of all, great paper. I mean, it's such a simple takeaway, right? Family matters. I think it's it's so obvious when I read it, but I confess I never thought about it before, which is kind of a, a great paper, right? Um, I had a bit of a, a big picture question. I was just wondering as I was reading it. So, you know, you've got sort, sort of the interesting part, right, is these ES funds in the non-ES families. And I was wondering when I looked at those percentages, can we learn something more by looking at what, which of these ES funds in the non-ES families, are there certain ones that consistently vote for these ES proposals when it does matter versus other ones kind of consistently don't? So, so as I read the paper, you're kind of grouping these together. I would love to separate them, right? And are there, are there cases where certain funds, you know, they, they do vote for when it matters? Does that relate to the governance of the family? Does it relate to what they invest in? You know, are these the funds that are investing in kind of really good ES firms instead of greenwashed ES firms? Um, so anyway, let me stop there. I think that's um, a great idea. I did not think about it before. Um, while you were talking, it sort of passed through my mind. I thought about, you know, how BlackRock was after Martin Schmaltz. Maybe after we'll do it, it'll be also after us, um, <laughs> if we're going to go this direction. But I do think, actually, that that's a, a, a wonderful suggestion to look whether there is persistency, not only in how the family itself vote, which we show, but look, are there sort of within those uh, uh, non-ES families and ES funds in non-ES families, it, do we see consistently that some of them do it? I think that can add another dimension to the paper which we have not done. Thank you. Exactly. I would love to know the answer. It wouldn't surprise me if it was the case, right? You know, I could really imagine that that is the case and it would be really kind of intriguing to see what you, what you found there. I will definitely, you know, we will definitely do it. It's even, it's, it's relatively easy to do and uh, for sure. A, a quick follow-up question on Michel, sort of to the larger picture perspective. I mean, as an investor, you would, if I want to invest in a green fund, why don't I use an ES fund in an ES family? Or you wonder how the non-ES families are able to attract so much investor money. You, your number was uh, like nearly half-half. Do you, is, is, there, is there a time trend? It's just like one god and the likes had just a starting advantage, but now actually not agree. ES families are catching up to, to, to attract more of that money. So for, I think I think that's you know so coming back to the whole issue of greenwashing and how can it be that those funds are able to do so much or even firm are able to do this extent of greenwashing. Um, I don't think, as Michelle said, even we were not aware of the big uh, effect of family uh, in the decision uh, when it comes to votes that matter. Um, and sort of one of the slides that I had to skip was really about the policy implication to the SEC, that it's not enough to ask them to report the average uh, uh, voting, but maybe actually to do uh, sort of a little bit more than that. That's first part of the question. Second part of the question, which uh, I, I think it's actually it's important to emphasize. Um, our data actually ends in 2018. It is pretty persistent throughout. But exactly like I showed the exponential increase in the fund that are flowing to ESG fund, it is possible that even the BlackRock and the fidelity of the world have changed in the last two, three years in a way that our data does not capture. Okay, and so we're talking only till 2018 and I'm 
fully cognizant of the fact that since then many changes have happened and maybe also some of their behavior. Great, thank you all. Okay, we are pressed for time, so we have to move on. The next speaker is Michelle on the ES list and the shareholder voice. So first, thanks to Mike, thanks to Miriam for inviting me to present here. Fun framework, I love it. It's always, always fun to present in a different framework. Um, this paper is going to relate in some kind of interesting ways to what Ronnie just talked about. So they're good to have in the same session. Uh, the title of the paper is ES Risks and Shareholder Voice. It's co-authored with Ellen He at Manchester and Biga Karaman at Oxford. Okay, so let me jump right into things. Um, a few kind of statistics, probably a lot of people in this audience know. Um, first, over the last decade, about a quarter of all shareholder proposals have related to environmental and social issues. So from the perspective of shareholder proposals, this is a big uh, segment of them. What perhaps is a little bit more surprising though is that the majority of these ES shareholder proposals are sponsored by asset management companies who by definition have a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder value. But despite the frequency of these proposals and the fact that the majority are sponsored by asset management companies, they almost never pass. So over the proposals during the 2004 to 2016 period, 1,643 failed and 15 passed which I think is interesting when you think about the fact that 53% of these are sponsored by an entity that has a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder value. So what's going on? What can we learn about this? We have sort of a few different questions we're um, looking at, but let me pose them in terms of the research hypotheses that, that we posit. So first, let's start with the basic fact, arguably, that mutual funds are striving to maximize portfolio value. What does that mean? Well, it means that fund managers should be incentivized to evaluate the value implications of ES-related issues in their portfolio firms. What's the implication? Well, arguably, fund managers should carefully evaluate these shareholder proposals that relate to ES issues. And that evaluation is gonna have a few components, right? They should think about what is the probability and the associated costs of a future negative ES incident at the firm? What's the extent to which this particular shareholder proposal, if it was implemented, would mitigate this probability and these future costs? And then finally, what are the costs of implementing the action underlying the shareholder proposal? If a sufficient number of mutual funds behave in this manner, so that is they are carefully evaluating these shareholder proposals, then ES proposals that gain higher support, but remember they always fail, they're not passing, they should represent negative signals about the firm, right? Many shareholders, if a lot of shareholders are voting for these proposals, it indicates that a lot of shareholders think that the firm should change their behavior in ways as outlined in the shareholder proposal. But because the proposal failed, the firm arguably did not change their behavior. So a lot of shareholders thought they should change the behavior, but they didn't. Well, what does that imply? It implies that the level of mutual fund support in failed ES proposals would be informative, in particular regarding the probability of future negative ES incidents and of future abnormal returns. And this is our main hypothesis, okay? So again, the idea that mutual funds are evaluating these issues up for vote when more fund managers support them, but the proposal fails, so management does not implement the action, then that is indicative of future negative ES incidents and negative returns at the firm. But there's a very plausible alternative hypothesis as well. Remember the statistic I started with, ES proposals almost never pass. Well, if a proposal type of proposal almost never passes and I'm a mutual fund manager with very limited time, what's the point of me spending a lot of time evaluating these issues? I'm super time constrained. Maybe I just focus my time on the issues where my vote is more likely to be impactful. Well, if that's the scenario that better describes the world, then mutual votes in these ES proposals are not going to be informative. And this generates all our alternative hypothesis, specifically that the level of mutual fund support 
in these failed ES proposals is not informative. Uh, in terms of data, we're going to get from ISS data on the shareholder proposals, who's uh, the proposal sponsor, how does ISS recommend for or against these proposals, and importantly, the individual mutual fund votes on each proposal. We're then going to use REPRIS data as a source of information on negative ES incidents at the firm. So REPRIS screens over 80,000 public sources in 20 different languages on a daily basis, tons of different sources. And when there's coverage of a negative ES incident at a firm, that's going to be our measure of a negative ES incident. OK, so let me jump right into our empirics. We sort of have a few kind of key pieces of evidence here. Let's start with our first main test. Does the level of mutual fund support in failed ES proposals predict future ES incidents? So we're going to estimate a regression. Our dependent variable is ES incidents over the in a particular firm over the subsequent one, two, or three years following a shareholder proposal on an ES proposal. And our uh, independent variable of interest is this interaction term, failed ES proposal times mutual fund support. What do we find? We find that conditional on a failed ES proposal, those with higher mutual fund support had significantly higher probability of negative ES assistance over the subsequent one, two, and three years. So what's the takeaway? The takeaway is that mutual fund votes seem highly informative regarding future firm ES risks. OK, but that's just the probability of an event. If I'm a mutual fund, what I really should care about is my effects on portfolio value, i.e., what are the ramifications to the firm value of these ES incidents? That's what we're going to look at in test two. But before going on to that, Let's just see, is the level of support in these failed E and S proposals, does it separately load for, does a failed E proposal predict E incidents and a failed S proposal predict S incidents? Yes, it does on both accounts. Okay, going on though to these abnormal returns, are these negative ES incidents that follow the shareholder proposals, are they associated with decreases in shareholder value? So what we do here is we identify a sample of firm years with a failed ES proposal that gained above median support. We calculate the daily alphas for each day over the one year period following the vote outcome. And we average those alphas over days with an ES incident versus without an ES incident. This is over the next one year period. We also do it over the next two and three year periods. What do we find? We find that the mean daily alpha on days with ES news is significantly negative over every horizon, and it's significantly lower than days without ES news. Can we ask questions now, or should we wait until the end? Until the end. OK, thank you. OK, so what do we have? We have mutual fund votes predict ES incidents, and these ES incidents are associated with falls in shareholder value. Let's put those together. Are the mutual fund votes informative regarding overall firm performance? So here we're going to estimate calendar time portfolio returns. Our sample, we're going to have a high ES support portfolio. That's formed by at the beginning of each month, we identify all firms that had a failed shareholder proposal within the past year, and that proposal had above median support will analogously form a low ES support portfolio the same way. We calculate returns on each portfolio each month and regress those returns on the four factors. What do we find? We find that the alpha on the long short portfolio is significantly negative. That is, firm years with highly supported ES proposals significantly underperform firm years that also had an ES proposal but most shareholders didn't really think it was a good idea to implement that proposal. The proposal received little support. OK, so results to this point, the level of mutual fund voting support for shareholder proposals on ES-related issues predicts the probability of subsequent ES incidents at the firm. 
These ES incidents, when they occur, are associated with significant decreases in firm value. And moreover, these mutual fund votes are informative regarding overall firm performance. Higher support and failed ES proposals predict negative long-run abnormal returns consistent with mutual funds evaluating the total value implications of these ES proposals. But these findings, I mean, they're nice, but they also raise a very obvious question, why on earth are more mutual funds not supporting these issues? And so here we're going to conjecture that agency related issues among some mutual funds contribute to a lack of support. We're gonna focus on two issues for our empirics. You could probably brainstorm some other issues potentially along the lines of what Ronnie was talking about as well. But what we're gonna focus on are investor myopia and funds friendliness towards management. Let's start with myopia. If ES issues entail upfront costs combined with benefits that are only realized over the long run, and if uncertainty impedes the market's ability to fully incorporate those long run impacts, then short term investors are going to tend to be less supportive of ES proposals. And there's some evidence for this in the investment front on ES literature. So that's going to be the first thing we look at. Second, we're going to look at funds friendliness towards management. If an issue is on the ballot as a shareholder proposal, then almost by definition, management is opposing it. And fund managers have various reasons that they're motivated to support management. They might want to win more business from companies, for example, management of company pension plans, they want to maintain open communication channels, et cetera, et cetera. So this is our fourth test where we look at the influence of agency factors on mutual fund votes. So our dependent variable is a dummy equal to one if the fund votes for the issue, zero otherwise. In the first column, we're looking at the influence of fund myopia or short-termism. So our proxy is flow performance sensitivity. We find that more short-term oriented funds are significantly less likely to support these issues. In the second column, we look at the influence of fund management friendliness. Our proxy here is the percent of management supported proposals on which the fund votes for even when ISS opposes. Again, what do we find? We find that friendlier funds are significantly less likely to vote for these proposals. And moreover, column three shows that that effect is concentrated when management is more short-term oriented as well. Uh, so in some mutual funds that are, more, that are subject to more agency are less likely to support these ES proposals. We have a variety of other findings, which I'll only mention briefly. Uh, first, the predictability relations, that is that mutual fund votes predict the probability of future ES incidents, and those incidences are associated with negative abnormal returns, are driven by the votes of less agency-prone funds, consistent with those fund votes being most informative. And we also have a natural experiment where we try to sort of further mitigate endogeneity concerns by focusing on dynamics around the BP disaster. So let me go ahead and conclude. What do we have? Shareholder proposals on environmental and social issues are common. They are often sponsored by an entity with a fiduciary duty to focus on shareholder value, but they nearly always fail. We find that mutual fund votes on these proposals are informative. They predict the probability of subsequent negative ES incidents. Those incidences are associated with significant decreases in shareholder value, and they predict overall lower firm performance. In terms of why more funds don't support these issues, agency issues seem to explain at least a portion of this dynamic. And we believe our findings present an intriguing contrast in terms of engagements as a way to you know, sort of make progress on these ES related issues versus shareholder proposals, which require by definition the support of a whole group of atomistic shareholders and the ways in which agency plays a role there. So let me stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, we already have three people that want to ask questions, Alon, Roni, and, and Marketa. So I hope, I hope we can get everyone together. Um, so we'll start from Alon, and then we'll go to Roni, and then uh, I hope we'll start with Marketa. Yes, Alon, you're first. All right. Um, so I guess my question has to do with market efficiency. I, I, why do you, I mean, the moment that you find drifts, then 
then it's a statement about market efficiency. It doesn't have to do with, you know, you know what whether the funds are short term or not. Even if they are, the question is, what does the market, you know, understand uh, the implications of fund support for future events? And so, if you do document the markets are inefficient, that seems to undermine, of course, any short term analysis of price reactions. So I'm just wondering, how do you think about? Of course. Then there's also the question, you know, how to show the causal impact of these funds for future events. But my, I guess my first my first question is, given your negative alphas for one, two, three years out, you know, I, you know, how do you interpret them? Um, yeah, um, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, thinking about this. So the way I I think about it is these these ES issues when you compare them to other types of shareholder proposals on things like corporate governance. We have such a wide body of evidence at this point in terms of how corporate governance matters. We still don't understand everything, but we have a lot of evidence on the ways in which that impacts firms. When we think about environmental and social issues, I think there is a lot more uncertainty on how these things matter, whether they matter, um, what the costs are of implementing them, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that you can argue that when uncertainty is so high, it, um, it makes it easier, it facilitates, it makes it more possible for fund managers to prioritize other things rather than just shareholder value maximization. Um, if a mutual fund votes against a classified board, they're going to get a lot more pushback pretty quickly, given the body of evidence we have, which we could debate as well, but leave that out, compared to whether they vote against an ES proposal, they can say, well, I just, I think that's motivated by uh, sort of ethical issues, not shareholder value implications. And I think that tension and the role of uncertainty goes a long way to explaining why the effects we find are as strong as they are for ES issues, whereas they're not for other types of issues. Right, but the question is, why doesn't a hedge fund that has nothing to do with these mutual funds understand that there's a relationship between fund support and future events and just, you know, either whatever, trade in the right direction and eliminate that predictability. And so that has, right, and that's the first question. And again, how do you know that any of those drifts have to do with your event about, rather than any, anything else about these firms? Uh, um, so, right. Okay, so two questions. In terms of why the hedge funds don't arbitrage this away, I mean, I do not have a perfect answer to this. You would expect that there would be a learning and that if we could divide our sample into different periods, that this effect would lessen over the period. I mean, there's always new events where we don't know if there's a relation and sort of people learn about it over time. Um, I We haven't looked at that. We certainly could. We could also look more at sort of what the source of this is, the feasibility. Yeah, it's fine. I'm just saying there. there's an implicit, there's an implicit added assumption in under your, your the null that you presented, which is the markets are inefficient or there there's some limits to arbitrage and within and, and that protects the drifts that you're documenting and, and the I question is what agree. are the implications of that okay i mean i think i completely agree i think it's a question that it's not sort of specific just to this paper i um whenever we find a market inefficiency you know we should be posing that question those are all the answers i have to it in this specific context but i completely agree with you like you know this is this is a great question Thank you very much, Anon. And now, Oni. Okay. Um, you just, uh, yeah, I know that we're a little bit over time, so I'll try to focus. Uh, so, before coming to my main question, first, as usual, uh, that's another uh, clever and informative and creating paper by Michelle here together with Big and Ellen. Always a uh, pleasure to read her papers. Uh, so, Michelle, when you start to present your main finding, you know, so if I intuitively actually wanted to change it slightly, uh, instead of asking why does, uh, uh, you know, support of funds are predictive, our support of fund predictive of uh, future uh, incidents, I think for me intuitively, the first question would be to ask whether the ISS support predicts future ES incidents. 
right? Because um, we know that many of them follow them. So, I mean, like maybe this is the starting point. But, uh, we actually, sorry, Ronnie, we, we do show that. I didn't present it in the interest of time, but we do find that ISS supports um, the incidents as well. No, no, I, I know, I saw it, but in terms of the, 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 the concept, uh, oh, I see. Where, where it's driving, I, I, I know that you have something there actually, I would just highlight it slightly differently. And, it, you know, but, but, but sort of more generally, and this may uh, be somehow related also to uh, uh, the issue that alone brought, but from a different perspective. Um, we know that the, in general, the literature suggests that the abilities of funds to predict future performance in general is limited, very limited. At best. Right. Why, why, me, why what might we expect that, uh, that along this particular characteristic, yes, funds possess this ability? Um, you know, it seems to me that maybe predicting the likelihood of such event is not any simpler than predicting cyber attacks or future sales and growth. Or, you know, it's not, it might even be easier to assess the firm G, the governance, than the firm ES, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can sort of shed a little bit more light along this line for me, please, to, to, to put it in bigger perspective, um, would be very informative. How this relate to, the, to those funds, you know, actually it's a question similar to what you asked me. How yeah. is this related to those fund ability to predict other events? Um, is it's there a great overall? Question. Is there... Yeah, let, I mean, let me just go, jump go ahead, in, go I guess, quickly again, in the interest of time. Yes. Um, I think it's important to remember we're not showing that like mutual funds are predicting the event. What we're showing is that mutual funds are evaluating the proposal and, and they could use a lot of different information to do that. And it might be interesting for us to look into that in more detail. Maybe they're you know, we find that results are stronger, or concentrated in proposals that are sponsored by an asset management company. You know, maybe the mutual fund is saying, oh, this proposal was brought by not just an asset management company, but asset management company XYZ. I have a lot of faith in their underlying valuation. And that's what I'm basing, I guess, what I'm basing my vote on. Like, that would be one way I think that is sort of more reasonable to interpret our results. But but your point is a good one, and we could definitely look into these issues in more detail. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aloni. Thank you, Alon. Thank you, Michelle. We have two more questions. We don't have time to present them, but I did uh, I did them, send them to your email, Michelle. One was by Enrikika. She asked about, do past ES incidents predict ES proposals and their support rates? And a related question by Alex Cooper, if an ES proposal is passed, does this predict future ES incidents? So I think great questions uh, and you'll have them in the, your email and I hope uh, they'll be useful. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you, Miriam. Yeah. And now we're going to go to our uh, third and last paper, um, which will be presented by uh, uh, Professor Geiska or Mazabo. Um, and the paper is titled The Big Three in Corporate Carbon Emissions Around the World. War is all yours. Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to present this paper. So this paper, I mean, uh, Miriam and, and Mike, uh, and uh, along with Michelle and Ronnie. So this paper is about the, the big three. Okay, so who are the big three? Uh, the largest investment management companies, okay? So uh, BlackRock, Vanguard, is Street Street. What is, what is special about them? I'm gonna go very quickly here because I think that you know we 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 all know this, right? I mean they're big. I mean we are talking about millions of trillions of, of dollars under management. I mean and uh, to a large extent they are they are passive. So, so many of their investment vehicles are are let's say index funds. So it says passive investment. Okay. So uh, what is our research question? Uh, research question is: Do firms reduce CO two emissions under the influence of the of the big three? Okay. So. Uh, to get an affirmative answer uh, to this question, we I guess we need that the big three do, do something about uh, carbon emissions and, and, and whatever they do, uh, it has an effect. So this is what we are trying to provide evidence for. So in terms of, let's say, why is this important? Um, well, I, I guess um, we are, let's say, immersed in a let's say, a global effort, a social effort to reduce carbon emissions. So, I mean, this is an externality. So the traditional sort of like um, 
you know, solutions for this internality, externality. I mean, what you would see in the books would be, you know, regulation, Picovian taxes. I guess, I guess the question is whether, you know, we can also contribute from the private sector, uh, you know, to reduce emissions, okay? Um, so, and, and also, uh, we think it, this this is sort of interest uh, because it speaks to the to the ongoing debate about the role of large indexes in the in the economy. So we, we know that there are some concerns about you know these these large indexes not being let's say proactive, not monitoring uh, the firms in their portfolio, and they invest, uh, investing in stewardship. You know they might uh, excessively defer to to corporate managers, uh, there could be anti-competitive effects. I mean, the whole firms in, in, in competing firms, uh, uh, there could be mispricing because there is uh, uh, you know, too much um, uh, passive investment. So these are the concerns that are sort of like on the table and there is, there is research, research on this. So we thought that, I mean, this paper could also kind of you know, add to, to, to this debate somehow. All right, so the hypothesis, I mean, uh, is it credible that the big three play a role in the in, in the decrease of, of uh, CO2 emissions? Well, uh, they say they care. I mean, here's an example of, of a public statement uh, by the vice chairman and global head of, of uh, impact investment of, of BlackRock. And they say also that they are doing something about it. Okay, so this is from the annual report of BlackRock 2019. Uh, as you can read there, over the past year, we have engaged with uh, over 200 companies on the topic of climate risk, some multiple times. Uh, during the course of our engagement, we have asked management and corporate boards to speak to board of our side of climate-related risk. So, I mean, it looks like, I mean, they are, they say at least that they are they are uh, doing doing something about it. And, and they are being very vocal also in public. Okay, so, I mean, uh, you can often see in the media Things like this, right? You know, top managers uh, of uh, of the big three uh, saying that they care about environmental issues, that they're going to take action, and, and so on and so forth. All right, then, but I guess the question is, why would they do it? Okay, so here's some potential uh, reasons. I mean, I guess one reason is that they compete with other investment options. So, uh, I mean, if they come across a screen, they might. Uh, Attract funds, or at least they might prevent some people from, you know, going to to, to green funds. Uh, it is also possible that climate risk affects the value of their portfolios. I mean, there is research suggesting that uh, it is a risk factor, uh, and that you know, it might affect the the, the cross sectional returns. And in terms of monitoring, it could be cheaper to monitor these sort of things, sustainability and. There's actually you know, some research suggesting that sustainability and governance issues are less costly than other firm specific issues like whatever m and or maybe maybe some voting issues uh, to, to monitor. Just go there with, a, with a, a checklist of things you know, to talk about with the, with the firm. And uh, you know, these, these things are relatively general and you don't have to do, let's say, too much specific research on, 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 on firm issues. Okay. And there is, um, I would say, you know, some um, uh, some anecdotal evidence that the, the, the big three are not completely passive. I mean, they might be passive investors, but not completely passive owners. I mean, they are they are doing some engagements. Uh, they are active in the regulatory process. Uh, they engage with index providers in the composition of the indexes. They participate in a standard setter uh, in a standard setting, for example, in, in SASB. So we 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 know this. So maybe you know there are reasons to believe that they are they care or they are starting to care. I mean, given the the recent interest in in uh, in environmental topics. Now, can they do it? Uh, well, they hold a substantial percent of the shares of the of the company. I mean, in some firms, uh, it could be five percent, ten percent, or even more. And at the very least, they could be uh, pivotal voters. I mean, in, in important issues, things that uh, management care about, like control contests, activist campaigns, uh, mergers. So maybe they have enough influence to actually, um, you know, push firms to reduce emissions. So let me uh, talk about the uh, the evidence. Here. Okay. So we have a a sample, um, a, a wide cross section of firms uh, from uh, in 24 countries. Uh, our data covers um, countries that are, let's say, covered by the M uh, MSCI index. Uh, we have uh, MSCI constituents, okay, so firms that are included in the index, and also other firms in the same country. Uh, for let me repeat, the countries that are covered by by uh, MSCI. 
All right, so here's our first uh, result. Okay, so um, uh, we collect data on engagements uh, by the big three. So this uh, data have, have, have become recently available, uh, publicly available. We collected the data and um, we found that, uh, first of all, I mean, there's, there's a substantial number of engagements. And also that these engagements are uh, related to, well, I mean, the, the stake of the, of the big three uh, in, the, in the company. Uh, which is, I guess, uh, related to, to, uh, to, and to the influence of the big three in the company. And also uh, it's related to um, the, uh, the amount of emissions of the firm. Okay? So, I mean, it is more likely that the, the, the big three engage with, with, with a firm that ha has a higher level of emissions. All right, I mean, here's the, the second result. Um, basically the idea is that, um, you know, we, we find, we collect data on, um, on CO2 emissions. These are estimations uh, by uh, a firm that is specialized in, in estimating these this sort of things. It's, it's called True Cost. Um, this data has been uh, used in, in other research uh, and related to, uh, to, to carbon emissions. So we, we find that uh, there is an association uh, between the holdings of, of the big three and uh, let's say uh, subsequent uh, carbon emissions. And uh, there is a negative association uh, suggesting that, well, I mean, if the big three are more influential in the firm, there is a higher prob probability that in the future we see a decrease in, in carbon emissions. We see that uh, the, the results are concentrated among MSCI firms. Okay, so that, and these are the firms that are, let's say, most preferred by the big three because uh, they, in many cases, they follow index and in, in, in specifically, uh, the MSCI uh, index. So we also find that the pattern is uh, concentrated in, in the most recent years, uh, which is sort of like consistent with this idea that the interest in, in uh, environmental issues is increasing and it has become, let's say, substantial or significant enough in the, in the, in, in, in the latest years. We uh, find that the patterns are, let's say, uh, more important, or more pronounced if uh, the, let's say, the stake of the big three in the company is larger. Okay, it's not, uh, I mean, it, it is larger if the, if the big three hold, let's say, 10% than if the big three holds, let's say, just 3% of the, of the shares. And uh, we check, uh, this is it's a variation of the, of the test. Basically, we use a, a, an indicator variable that takes the value of one if the increase in big three holdings is greater than 1%. So basically the idea of this test is to get rid of cases in which let's say the influence of the big three is uh, less clear. And as you can see, we, uh, we get, let's say a clear result on that one. All right, so we also find that uh, the patterns uh, we document uh, are uh, this association between uh, big three ownership and, and, and subsequent CO2 emissions. These patterns are more pronounced if uh, there's a higher probability of engagement. Okay, so I mean, uh, uh, here you have an independent, uh, a dummy variable, an, an uh, indicator variable, big three target that takes the value of one. If the probability of being engaged by the big three uh, is uh, let's say in the top quintile, top quartile, top tercile of the of the distribution. Now we also find that the pattern is uh, more pronounced uh, if uh, let's say the the big three uh, have uh, let's say publicly committed to uh, do something about uh, about uh, emissions. Okay, so how do we find? Uh, how do we measure? I'm sorry, this commitment. Well, I mean, we, we take uh, data on activity, policies, disclosures related to engagement, uh, voting, uh, poli public statements, whether, uh, let's say, the, the big three becomes a PRI signatory. So we form an index based on, on, this, uh, on this information. And uh, we find that, let's say, this is an index, as, as, you, as you can see here, varies over time we find that uh, when we observe, let's say, a stronger commitment by the, by the big three to, um, uh, let's say, engage uh, in, uh, in environmental issues, uh, the association between uh, big three holdings and subsequent CO2 emissions becomes stronger, right? And uh, lastly, we, we um, look at the years when we uh, observe, let's say, a higher increase in the index, okay? So, for example, 2017 for BlackRock, uh, 2014 for a state street 
and we um, we take a short window around those dates. Okay, so and uh, we 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 do find in the short window that uh, let's say after the the, the increased commitment uh, of the of the fund, uh, there is a higher probability of observing a, a decrease in in uh, CO two emissions. And lastly, uh, this is going to be the last test I'm going to talk about um, to address uh, or to mitigate uh, endogeneity concerns. Uh, we exploit the reconstitution of uh, the Russell 1000 and the Russell 2000 uh, index. Okay, so this is something that has been used by prior literature. This is not, not anything new. I mean, uh, I think this is a test like you know relatively uh, well accepted in the literature. And the idea is that when a firm, let's say, goes from Russell, let's say the, bo the, the, the bottom of, of Russell 1000 to the top of Russell uh, 2000, there is, uh, let's say, a, a mechanical increase in, in, uh, in the ownership of, of uh, institutional holdings. And uh, this, uh, let's say, this change or this increase in, in, institu in institutional ownership does not necessarily you know, have to do with fundamentals. I mean, there are sort of like random factors that might, uh, let's say, um, and make a, a firm, you know, to, to drop from from one index to to the other. If we look at the margin, okay, and uh, you know, if we if we sort of look at the the, the ownership of the big three uh, related to this change in in index, I mean, it looks like this increase in ownership is still you know associated with uh, subsequent uh, carbon emissions. All right, so here are the conclusions. Uh, the big three engage with firms with higher emissions. The big three influence is associated with lower emissions and the pattern suggests that the big three influence plays a role in the reduction of corporate, corporate uh, CO2 emissions around the world. I guess I'm on time. So uh, this, is, this is all I have. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Let's have a couple of questions. Christoph, why don't you start, please? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for this really cool paper and uh, interesting presentation. I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more if there's more in your research about how exactly these portfolio firms achieve a reduction in CO2 emission. The reason I'm asking is that I'm wondering about their overall worldwide sort of uh, uh, um, equilibrium effect on overall CO2 emissions. There's this whole literature showing that firms sort of move their their dirty activities, their polluting activities to other areas if, uh, if uh, restrictions from a regulatory perspective become more stringent. And so I was just wondering if you if you can tell us a little bit more about do they just sort of move their co2 activities to a different place or, or sort of outsource these or is it that they uh increase their efficiency and their the technology that helps them reduce their co2 emissions yes well i mean uh, unfortunately i cannot answer this question i mean it's a it's a, it's a little bit beyond the, the uh, what we have the, the answer i mean uh, you know the, the answer i'm, I'm going to give you is a little bit speculative because we, we don't have evidence on that okay i mean uh, as you said it, it could be something related to technology it could be i mean there there are things that are you know, relatively let's say cheap to do and so i mean there is there are reasons to believe that you know they can get a let's say a short-term effect on on on, on co2 emissions I mean, uh, and other things are going to be a little bit, you know, they're going to take longer and, uh, you know, they might imply, uh, let's say, a technological change. As you said, you know, it might be the case that they are, you know, they are moving around things, uh, right, like, you know, uh, production and things like that. Unfortunately, we, we don't have that. I mean, in the paper, uh, the, I mean, we, you know, we um, hypothesize a little bit about, you know, the, 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 the potential ways of doing this. I mean, of course, one wastes reducing uh, re reducing sales volume, right? Reducing volume. Um, we we don't have too much evidence of, on on that, so I, I guess we will leave this open for future research. Okay, thank you, Alan. Alan, you have uh, a question? Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm curious just to know um, the, the the people that 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 presumably opine on, on emissions at these firms, are they coming from the same governance teams at these big three? You just structurally, when you say the big three do, who exactly uh, does it? Is it the same you know, handful of people that are supposed to deal with the, you know, uh, you know, the governance in general that now presumably know what a coal factory in Germany should or should not do and, and, and so the question is, you know, what exactly is going on? I mean, I can I sort of understand how it might be possible for somebody from BlackRock to call up, you know, Exxon, which they didn't up until 2017, Why right? They didn't even care about the two degrees warming, but maybe they did call up firm in the US. 
do you think that they actually picked up the phone and called somebody in France to say fire up another nuclear plant or something like that? Uh, so, so who does it? How do they? Uh, um, so I had my thing on. Who does it? Uh, how do how, how do they do it? Uh, how do they reach out to all these companies? Um, and I'll stop there. Yeah, I guess that, I mean, that, yeah, it's another excellent question. I mean, I, I guess it's a centralized function here. So, I mean, they have some people working full time on this. And the, the size, uh, and uh, I guess we, we also talk about this at, at some point in the paper, we, we did some, some specific search on this. The, the size of this team is increasing over time. So they might have, let's say, 50, 70 people uh, working uh, at the, the headquarters of Black Rock. So they, I mean, at least what they say is they, they go around and, and, and they have meetings with firms. Um, they have, let's say, presidential meetings uh, and, uh, and they publish, uh, in, in, there's, a, there's a stewardship report that they publish uh, every year. They publish the list of firms with which they have engaged. And that is the-, the oh, information. Michelle probably know better, better than me, but I think this is a more of a recent phenomenon. I'm just saying in 2017, that was the first time that the big three supported two degree warming at Exxon. They didn't support it up until that point. Yes. And so I'm just curious, you know, are these sort of stewardship, you know, where they report who they met with go further back in time? Um, uh, do you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, like, you know, the, the, the results I, I show, they, they are concentrated in, in the most recent years. Okay? So I'm like, before 2017, 2016, we, we find very little, which is sort of consistent with what, what, what you are saying. I mean, uh, what, what, I, what I'm, these results I'm showing are like very recent. I guess, you know, this is here to stay, but uh, we don't mean that this existed, let's say, 10, 10, uh, 10 years ago. Okay. Thank you, Gaiska. I'm afraid we can come to an end. I mean, anybody who saw the program would not have thought that we actually can keep exactly in time, but I think we're only about five minutes over, which is pretty impressive given we covered three papers. So I would like to thank everybody who joined the spotlight. And in particular, obviously, I would like to thank Michel, Ronnie, and Gaiska for presenting a very neat and interesting papers. Okay. Bye to everybody. Hope to see you on the next spotlight. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you.